Hey, welcome to my first Facebook Live Q&A. So, I reached out to a few of my members of the Virtual Fitness Mastermind and asked them if they had any questions they'd like me to address during this first Q&A session. And we, we got a few that came back. So, I'm gonna go down the list and uh, hopefully this will offer you some value for your business too. So, first off, we've got Kevin. And Kevin has a two-part question. The first part, he's asking, how do you know when you have enough employees? You know, he's got over 200 clients coming through the door. Uh, he's got multiple facets to his program, boot camp, semi-private training. Um, you know, so how do, how do you know when you have enough employees? And I would tell you the first place to, to look is, are all the jobs that you want to be done being done at the level that, that you're looking for, a level that you're happy about how it represents you? So. When you do that, you know, you're taking an honest assessment, an honest evaluation of, you know, how the work's being done in your business. Then we need to look at, okay, with the people that we have, are we training them well? Are we giving them an effective job description? Do they know what their responsibilities are? Are we coaching them to those responsibilities so they know how to execute the plan? And if things aren't being done at the level that you want, but you're happy with, the level of training, the level of coaching, the, you know, the, the understanding that, that your current team has of their responsibilities, then it's probably time to look for somebody else to add to your team. But I would tell you it's a mistake to just throw money at hiring an employee unless you're getting you know, the most out of your existing employees. Now, as an, you know, as an additional thought for this, you know, you have to think about what your strengths are. If you're spending a lot of time in your business working on things that aren't your area of strength or aren't, you know, tied to your personal unique ability, that's when you need to look at who can I outsource this to? Who can I delegate this to? How can I streamline this? And if you don't have somebody on your team currently who can assume those responsibilities and do it at a level that would be you know, acceptable as a representation of your business, then, you know, you may need to hire somebody, but that could be a, you know, an outside contractor. Like if you're doing bookkeeping, you don't need to bring that person in the house. So there are a couple different ways to look at that. But, you know, the first thing we have to look at is, are things being done at, you know, across the board at a level that we're happy about? If not, are the people that we're asking to do them being put in a position to succeed doing those things? If they are, but there's just too much you know, too much demand and not enough supply of personnel to go around, that's when we need more staff. Now, the second part of his question is, you know, how long do we keep somebody around if we don't feel like they're, they're performing to the level that we want? And, you know, it's a good question because, you know, a, a lot of times somebody comes into our business and, and we just throw money at the problem, right? Like we just say, hey, I'm going to, to hire somebody to be part of our team and that'll just solve the problem. And we say, okay, well, here's your job description or here are your responsibilities and we ask them to just go out and work. But that's not really the way it works. If we want to be successful, we need to coach those people up. I mean, we're pretty fortunate in our industry. I mean, our profession is coaching. Our profession is helping people to reach their potential. So if you know if we have that skill if that's something that we practice every day with our clients we have to look in the mirror and say are we doing that with the people on our team and if we're not then before i go and and you know kind of discard somebody i need to coach them up and i need to say am i doing my best work in you know understanding what i'm trying to get them to accomplish assessing where they are currently and then coaching them to bridge that gap if I'm doing that and they're, they're not getting it, then you know they may be a great person, but they're not a great fit, and it's probably time to move on. And I, I'll tell you, from my own personal experience, I, you know, I've, I've had to fire a number of people over time, and I've never been happy about it, and frankly, it's one of the most miserable experiences that, that I think you can have as a business owner, but not one time in my life have I ever regretted letting somebody go so they can find a business that suits them or, or a job that suits them. In fact, the regret is usually that I let it drag on too long. So next up we have Ty. And Ty's question is, how important is email marketing if you don't run an online business? And 
then as a, as a second piece to that, how do we attack list building in 2017? So I would tell you email marketing is important if you make it important. And, and it's not really a cop-out answer because really connection is important. And that's what our focal point has to be. Are we connecting? Are we connecting with the people that we want to work with? Are we connecting with the people that we currently work with? Are we connecting in a way that they're sharing this with the other people in their lives who might be a good fit for what we do? Now for me, as you probably know, email marketing is the way that I do that. I've sent out a daily email for about 10 years. I mean, you know, that rough estimate, that's about 3 million words of daily email. So um, for me, it's important. That's not the only way that you can connect. I mean, obviously we're doing Facebook Live right now, so that's another way for you to connect with somebody. But I prefer email marketing if you're really good at it because most people aren't. I think most people won't take the time to go out there and, and write something meaningful to, to try to inspire somebody, to try to, to give them something that makes their day better so it allows you to show up differently than your competition. So if, if your preference is email marketing or if you're willing to do the work to get good at email marketing, it's a huge opportunity whether you're an offline business or an online business. Now, if you're not, you need to find another way to connect with that audience. So uh, Facebook Live is a great way. I mean, there are other channels that you can use. And then if you do that and you have people on an email list, you're just routing them to the, the channel of communication that you prefer. Now, how do you attack list building? I, I mean, I think list building is pretty simplistic, right? You're giving somebody something so valuable that they'd be willing to pay for it, but instead they're just paying for it with their email address, right? So my goal when I, when I go, go about list building is I want to give somebody a, a, a tool or a resource or, or a book or a product or something valuable enough that they might have paid somebody else for it, right? Like as valuable as other people might be offering products. And, and then all I'm asking in exchange is you to pay for it by giving me your contact information. And I think that if we do that, if we give somebody something really valuable, and we're just finding other ways to get it in front of the people that we're trying to reach, be it Facebook advertising or be it, you know, through, through things like YouTube or be it, you know, um, you know, tied to a Facebook Live post or, you know, through other channels locally. I mean, you can do direct response marketing and drive people to opt in on an email list. You can work with other businesses and create strategic alliances and allow them to give out gifts to their audience. I mean, there's so many options that you have you have to be creative. I mean, Facebook advertising is kind of the default for everybody and it works, but it's crowded. So don't be afraid to step away and look for other channels to connect with people. All right, so Jenny asks, should you wait to fire a trainer until you have a replacement? Uh, or, you know, do you just get over, you know, I mean, get it over with and scramble to find the right person? And, you know, and I, she throws a disclaimer out there, you know, I know it probably, do, you know, depends on circumstances. Well, um, I would tell you it kind of depends on the degree of uh, discomfort you have with this trainer. If it's because they're not great, then you can probably give them a little longer runway while you're looking for somebody. If it's because they're really a bad ambassador for your business, just cut and move on and... You know, and, and yeah, everybody's gonna have to be kind of all hands on deck when that happens, and somebody else is gonna have to pick up the slack. But, you know, I mean, you don't want somebody out there who is a cancer in your business or, or is undermining, you know, undermining the, you know, the culture that you have, the experience you wanna deliver. So if somebody really is, is that, then you need to get rid of that person as quickly as possible because it really is making everything else that you're doing, the, you know, the marketing, the selling, the culture everybody else is trying to create, it's making that worse. So if that's the case, then you need to move on. Um, all right, so Michelle asks, what about thoughts on additional avenues of marketing to, to local prospects when Facebook is flooded and saturated with ads? Well, I, I think Facebook Live is a great way to approach this because it allows you to, to be authentic, allows you to let people know, like, and trust you. So there's that option. I think Facebook advertising, if you're going to offer something different where you're not sending people directly to, 
you know, to, to a transformation contest or directly to a paid offer. And you're giving them that kind of exchange of value that, that I shared when I answered Ty's question, um, giving them something so valuable that expect to pay for it otherwise. I think that's a great channel. But I think that there are a lot of people in everybody's local community that can help them open doors. I mean, do you have local spas? Do you have local chiropractors, massage therapists, um, local retail stores that, that serve your target market? Probably. Are your clients members of local homeowners associations? You know, are, are they in neighborhoods where you can go out there and do other things to reach them? What's even better about this now is so many people have defaulted to using Facebook and specifically Facebook advertising that they've created this kind of uh, void in all these other channels that you can use to your advantage. You can go out there and show up. Like if you want to be the only person doing direct mail, whereas before there might have been three or four people doing it, now you're going to win that category. If you're the only one going out doing public speaking, you are going to win that category. So go find some things that, that allow you to reach the people that you want to reach and allow you to be authentic, allow you to stand out so they can know, like, and trust you. There are a ton of options. It really, it's almost like hitting rewind and going back to, you know, what would we have done five years ago to go attract clients? If you look at that, there are going to be a lot of things that people have moved away from that created a gap that you can go in and fill and have a lot of success. All right, so Fred asks, as the owner of a business, what's the best way to remove yourself from day-to-day -day operations? Well, I think the best way to do it is to do it, A, gradually, right? So we don't want to just disappear, right? Because people came to the business because they do know, like, and trust you. So you kind of want to transition to a point where maybe if you were training somebody three sessions a week or you were running three group, you know, group classes a week, maybe now you're doing two, maybe now you're doing one. So you're, we're reducing the volume of, of actual training, but you're still around, you're visible. And then kind of that second step is be the mayor, right? Be the person who shows up, you're, you're shaking hands, you're talking to people, you're maintaining relationships. Do that. Be the person who sends out the newsletter so they know you're still around. Be the person who's on video if you are doing Facebook Live or anything like that. So you're still around, but maybe you're not the day-to-day -day technician. To me, that's the best way to transition out, and it's the safest way because, you know, yeah, over time, you can even reduce that and, and help to put somebody else in that kind of assistant mayor role, but we don't want to... Be, be the person who brought somebody in this bait and switch where we said, okay, you know what, no, I'm the person you're gonna work with, now I'm gonna hand you off to this person that you don't have the same relationship with, you don't have the same type of faith in, right? I mean, I've seen that a lot in the fitness business world, right? People say, hey, I'm gonna coach you, and then they hand you off to somebody that doesn't have any real you know, business experience. They hand you off to somebody that's never run a business successfully, and you know, hey, wait a minute, I've got more business experience than this person does. And imagine how you'd feel as the consumer in that role. Well, that's the same way a lot of your clients may feel if you just disappear when it comes to, you know, being the person in the gym that they've originally built that relationship with. All right, so um, Dan asked something along kind of a similar line, right? What do you do when clients expect you to be the person in the training session? Um, you know, and you're not around. Well, I mean, Dan, same thing, right? Be the mayor, be around. You don't necessarily have to be the person that's training them constantly, but there's so many other ways you can connect with them. So think of it as we've got the, the actual technician role of being the trainer, and then we've got the relationship. Well, hand off the training role, but maintain the relationship, and then make sure they have confidence in the person taking on that technician role. It help them understand why that person is following your plan, why that person is going to be great at what they do. If you do that, now we're basically, you know, passing some authority to that person so they can learn to trust them as a coach that's going to give them the results that they want. All right, so Greg asks, how do you get coaches to actively promote your business and bring in new business for you? Um, in my opinion, you don't. In my opinion, yeah, you, you have them serve as people that go out there and help generate word of mouth by doing a great job, by facilitating referrals, so they're using your referral strategy. But they don't, you know, they, they don't need to be 
the marketers for your business because if they are, they're gonna be your competition. If they're great at coaching, they're great at selling, they're great at marketing, why do they need you, okay? So I think you're asking them to do, the, do more than you probably should be asking them for. Ask them to be great coaches and create a culture that people want to spread the word about and to execute your referral systems. If they're doing that, that's the role they can play in this and do it at a high level. And then the last question that we have comes from Dan again. Industry-wide, what's a good retention rate? Um, you know, realistically, in my opinion, a, a good retention rate, when we're talking about a business that has under 100 clients, is probably in that 96, 97 range. And then if we've got over 100 clients, maybe 95, 96. Um, and the way that we would measure that is simply like, okay, what is the, you know, who are the clients that we have on the first day of the month? How many of those clients are still with us on the first day of the next month? Okay, so, you know, sometimes I think people confuse how to measure retention. They confuse how to, uh, you know, how to manage that number because they just look at, well, hey, we had 150 clients. Now we have 150, you know, and it's a month later. Well, yeah, but you had some turnover, and so that's not a retention number we're looking for. So how many people were, or who, were, who was here on the first day of the month? Who's here the first day of the next month? Ideally, if we got under 100 clients, 96, 97 is a good number to shoot for. Um, over 100 clients, 95, 96 is probably realistic because, we, you know, some people are going to move. Some people, um, you know, just kind of fall off the face of the earth. But if we're maintaining at that rate and then we're, out there doing what we need to do for business growth, we're gonna be in pretty good shape. So uh, that's all the questions we had for today for the first Facebook Live Q&A. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I'll be back next week and we'll do it again. So if you do have questions, be sure to share them here on the page and uh, we'll cover them in the next session. So thanks a lot.